Our next speaker will be Vikram Patanayak from Massachusetts General Hospital speaking on defining and improving Cas9 specificity. Thank you, Vikram. All right, so uh, before I begin, just uh, for full disclosure, uh, I have uh, some intellectual property related to my talk that's been licensed to Editas Medicine, but um, I promise to give you as uh, full of an overview as, as I can. So um, the other thing to mention is uh, uh, all of the uh, materials that I'm going to talk about that I've published on are available on AdGene. And uh, just for those of you who are getting interested in genome editing for the first, ta first time, uh, there are a ton of um, constructs available on, on AdGene that uh, can really help you get started. So um, it's a really good resource, and it's actually rather easy to, to just get your feet wet. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, the specificity of genome editing agents. I'm going to focus mainly on Cas9. Um, and I think uh, Fyodor uh, alluded to it. Um, the real question is kind of, for your application, uh, what level of specificity do you need? Uh, so uh, our understanding of Cas9 has actually evolved quite a bit uh, from uh, the, the first description. Um, but let me start as kind of a human genome-focused application. Um, that's kind of what my research has focused on so far. Um, so you guys know the human genome is roughly 3 billion base pairs, right? So I think you guys know the answer to this, uh, given how hot Cas9 is and all the papers and all the work. But just from a basic, you know, bottom-up perspective, if you want to edit something in a genome of a complex organism, you need to make sure that it can hit the site you want without hitting other sites, right? That's the overall uh, specificity question. But it's also a question of whether you can actually even specifically target something in a genome. So the human genome's 3 billion base pairs, and if you modify, if you uh, model it as a random collection of A's, C's, G's, and T's, uh, then you can ask the question, well, what is the chance that you're going to uh, find any given 22 base pair target site in the genome? Or another way to put this is, how complex uh, does a genome have to be for 22 base pairs to be specific? And I say 22 base pairs because the canonical Cas9 target site is 20 base pairs that's uh, specified by your guide RNA, and then uh, two base pairs, GG, canonically uh, specified by your PAM. Okay, so if you, model, if you model this, the genome as a random collection of A's, C's, G's, and T's, and this is the target site you've got, uh, you've got a one in four chance of putting each, uh, each base pair at each position. Um, so you have 22 base pairs, uh, and so uh, a 22 base pair sequence would be unique statistically in a four to the 22nd or 10 to the 13th base pair genome. Now, the interesting thing is when um, Martin Jinnick and uh, Je Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier published their first paper on uh, the use of Cas9 um, uh, protein uh, guide RNA complexes to, uh, to uh, uh, cut DNA, the specificity of Cas9 wasn't actually uh, necessarily so clear. So um, this is one of the figures from their paper where, uh, oops. Uh, so they took uh, several target sites, and so the PAM isn't listed here, um, but they took target sites that were mismatched at the ends, and they did an in vitro cleavage assay. And you can see that these guys down here uh, all cut with, uh, you know, at least 50 percent efficiency in this in vitro assay. And so this one here has six spaces that were uh, mismatched at the, at the end of the molecule. So when I first saw this paper, I was wondering, well, you know, is Cas9 even specific enough to, uh, to modify the genome uh, at all? Because uh, let's say you have 15 bases out of the 22 that are, you know, specified. Well, 4 to the 15th would be 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 9th which would then put you on the scale of the human genome. So we know, now know that's not true. Uh, subsequent papers from uh, Feng Zhang's lab, George Church's lab, and Jennifer Doudna's lab showed that, indeed, you can um, 
you can use Cas9 to modify your target site of interest in a human genome. And this uh, kind of spawned the first of many, 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 many studies into Cas9 specificity. Um, so in Feng Zhang's paper, uh, the, in Feng Zhang's paper, they, sorry, I keep on hitting the wrong button. Um, in Feng Zhang's paper, they started basically uh, a very crude specificity study by taking, by making mismatched guide RNAs at uh, several positions along the target site. And it's going to be hard to make out this gel, but I'll just say that uh, these three guide RNAs down here with mismatches uh, at varying positions at the PAM distal end uh, had somewhat equal modification in this kind of early system uh, to the uh, intended guide RNA target site pair. Uh, suggesting that Cas9 specificity is good enough to modify your site of interest, but uh, that there might be some off-target sites. Um, so if all you're concerned about is hitting what you want to hit and you're not worried about what else it's going to hit, Cas9 from the early days was certainly going to be good enough for that application. Um, but then the next question was off-targets. Um, and so uh, several papers uh, that came out in 2013 kind of took a, a more in-depth look at on-targets. Um, so some of them uh, uh, looked kind of going, mutating individual positions, making single mismatches um, along the target site. Um, so this is one from Feng Zhang's lab, which uh, showed, uh, along with the early Doudna genic study, that uh, perhaps Cas9 was... Uh, more permissive of mismatches at the PAM distal end of the target site and uh, less permissive of mismatches closer to the PAM. Um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a result that uh, I also saw in a different in vitro assay, um, and the colors are switched here, so uh, more specific in, in my figure is, is the sort of darker colors. Um, but it turns out that when you go beyond single mismatches sites, so off-target sites, that instead of having one mismatch, um, which are actually you know, rather uh, rare in the genome, uh, when you go to off-target sites that have more than one mismatch, um, the picture gets a little bit more complicated, and you get a picture that looks a little bit more like this. So certainly more study uh, was needed, uh, and 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 basically, people started asking the question, well, you can kind of do mechanistic studies like the ones I showed you where you march, you kind of rationally march through Cas9 and tar its target sites and look to see which positions can be modified, which can't. Um, and I think that's a really interesting and informative question. Uh, but people started to say, well, we want to modify, let's say, the human genome, so why don't we just design assays to go into the human genome and pick out all the off-target sites that, that we can identify in the genome. Um, so there are a bunch of different genome-wide um, off-target methods um, uh, from Keith, Jung lab, uh, Keith Jung's lab, Jinsu Kim, Feng Zhang, um, Christoph Van Kalle, many others. Um, they basically all work on the same principle. And you know, what that principle exactly is in molecular detail isn't necessarily important for this audience. But just as an overview, you basically take either cells or genomic DNA from cells, um, expose it to your Cas9 guide RNA complex uh, that you're interested in studying uh, so that Cas9 will hit the on-target site and whatever off-target sites exist in that genome and create double-strand breaks. And then basically, some sort of molecular biology magic is used to tag those double-strand breaks, whether it be integration of an oligonucleotide or just simple ligation of an adapter followed by ultra-deep sequencing. Um, the details don't necessarily matter. In some way, you tag that double-strand break, and then you use a tag as a proxy to read out the site that got modified. So um, uh, Keith Jung's lab has uh, used a technique called GuideSeq that does this uh, in cell culture, and so I'll focus on that. Um, and basically, the results of GuideSeq showed that uh, there are off-targets. Um, 
the one the one the number of off targets we can detect are you know somewhere from uh, zero in in one case to uh, several, you know two hundreds, um, and it's kind of dependent on your uh, dependent on your target site. And so just to illustrate this, uh, historically, uh, e the EMX1 gene, uh, which was one of Feng Zhang's interests, um, uh, has been kind of extensively studied, uh, both in specificity and just activity. Um, and so you can see that for EMX1, uh, you obviously only have one on-target site. And if you search the genome for sites that look like it, so you know, as a proxy, you can say, OK, you're more likely to get off-target effects at sites that look like your intended on-target site, right? So if you think about um, restriction endonucleases, which probably a lot of you have used, um, you know that if, at least with early restriction endonucleases, if you were off by one, you might still get some activity at that site, right? And then they, they made high-fidelity enzymes, and you know, that kind of eliminated that. But so you, you know, generally speaking, you try to avoid things that look a lot like the site. So, uh, EMX1 has no sites that have one mismatch, uh, four sites with two, but then this kind of goes up pseudo exponentially. Um, it turns out that EMX1 is, a, is actually a pretty good site. So if you're gonna, if you have a target site of interest, you want to minimize uh, the matches to the genome. Um, I didn't put the data here, but some of these other sites, especially these VEGF sites, uh, actually are very repetitive in the genome. And so they have, a, there are a lot more potential off-target sites, which is part of the reason why more off-target sites were, were detected. Um, uh, because it, the genome isn't actually a random collection of ACs, Gs, and Ts, like I asserted at the beginning. Um, and that'll, I think that will uh, come into play later as well. OK, so. So you do one of these uh, genome-wide off-target um, screen selections, and you get the data back. And this is kind of what it looks like. So this is this EMX1 site. Um, and you can see the on-target site is here. And so the mismatches here are uh, labeled with colors and letters. Um, and you can see various uh, levels of um, off-target activity. So the strength of the off-target site, per se, is, is kind of uh, sort of from top to bottom. Um, and you can see the general theme that uh, Doudna and then uh, the rest of us started to see uh, holds where the part of the target site that's near the PAM is uh, more highly specified than the part of the target site that's away from the PAM. But it's not a perfect uh, correlation. So, you know, you will see off-target sites where, you know, here are two mutations near the PAM and it still gets recognized somewhat well. Um, which goes to the point um, of uh, computational prediction tools. So um, there are a lot of computational prediction tools out there um, when you're trying to design a guide and you're getting, you know, familiar with Cas9 and you say, okay, well, how do I, how can I predict what off targets are going to be there? And so you go to some computational prediction tool and it'll spit out a result will say, you know, here are the potential off-target sites, and, and, and some of them will rank, you know, this is the most likely off-target site. Um, if you take Keith's GuideSeq data um, in the blue circle and overlap it with two different computational uh, prediction tools, um, you'll see that the overlap uh, in some cases is, is adequate, but in most cases is not that strong. Um, so, and, and I take the GuideSeq data to be kind of the, the validation, the gold standard set here since it's experimentally validated. Um, so, as you guys are thinking about off-targets, use Cas9, use off-target prediction programs. Um, I just want you to be aware that they're actually a really good tool to evaluate, evaluate different uh, potential guide RNAs because uh, it, you know, there are very few uh, easy ways to, to compare off targets and, and guide RNAs. Uh, so they're useful, but they don't tell the whole story. Okay, so uh, Cas9 has off target effects, um, but 
these off-target effects, you know, there are a few off-targets, and I think for most research applications, um, it's certainly good enough, right? Um, and if you're doing genome-wide screens, if you're doing basically any application you're doing, um, you can use multiple guide RNAs targeted to the same gene if you're doing a knockout. And uh, if the sequences of the guide RNAs are sufficiently different, your off-target profiles will be different. And if you get the same result, then you can be pretty happy. Okay, so um, part of my interest is in developing genome editing tools for, uh, for therapeutic use. And so that becomes a very different level of, uh, of specificity that's needed, right? Because if you're uh, putting Cas9 into a person, you want to make sure that not only are you not hitting, you know, your gene of interest, but that you're not, that you're not hitting anything uh, you know anything like a tumor suppressor gene that could that could cause um, uh, that could cause difficulty in the clinic. Um, so I'm going to summarize a lot of work basically by saying that uh, Cas9 or in I'll say streptopyogenes Cas9. So uh, uh, what Fyodor didn't mention is there are actually various there are different flavors of Cas9 itself. There's streptopyogenes Cas9, Staph aureus Cas9. There are other CRISPR variants like CPF1. So there are a lot of things out there. Um, a lot of the research right now is still focused on streptopyogenes Cas9. Um, what I'll say is there are uh, engineered variants that, are, uh, that have improved specificity. So uh, this is one that I engineered uh, as a fellow in Keith Jung's lab, which has four, uh, four alanine substitutions. And if you look at uh, this variant by GuideSeq at uh, eight different target sites, which would be in the blue. Um, and the reason you only see four lines is that uh, for some of these loci, there were multiple guides targeted to, to the same gene. Um, you go from having, uh, I think, 65 total off target sites in the orange for, for wild type uh, streptopyogenes Cas9 to a single off target site for, for one of those guides um, for this. SP Cas9 HF1. Um, so the specificity problem, I won't say it's been solved, but there are uh, high fidelity variants. Um, my variant's not the only one. Uh, Feng Zhang uh, published uh, a variant ESP Cas9 uh, that has a similar specificity profile. Um, Jennifer Doudna's lab uh, just published kind of a, a family of modified Cas9s. Uh, which have improved specificity. Um, there were other variants in, in our initial paper. Um, and then uh, CPF1, uh, which was recently described uh, by Feng Zhang, so I guess recently is <laughs> several years now, but uh, um, uh, that also has a specificity profile that's very similar to SPCAS9HF1. So um, uh, there are a number of ways to uh, uh, to improve specificity. Um, and there's a lot more on the horizon. So in addition to uh, cutting DNA and uh, using either NHGJ or HDR, uh, David Liu's lab from Harvard um, has, in the last few years, uh, described various base editors that uh, don't require double-strand cleavage, um, but basically can uh, in a very, uh, in a very sort of well-defined window of a few nucleotides, um, make uh, single nucleotide substitutions. It, now it's a little bit of a messy process, but um, this potentially increases specificity as well. And this is something that, if you're not familiar with, I suggest you uh, you read about. We don't have time uh, right now to talk about it too much, but this could potentially also increase specificity uh, as well. So. Um, so that goes to say that CRISPR variants can leave minimal to no detectable off-target mutations. Okay, but that's not the whole story. So, and this is kind of goes back to what your ultimate end game is for. So um, I agree with Fyodor that for clinical use, you can make Cas9 variants or genome or zinc finger variants that. Uh, are certainly specific enough for, uh, for their use. Um, 
but there are still challenges, right? So uh, I'll highlight two. Uh, uh, the first is naturally occurring genetic variation. Um, so off-target predictors um, or these genome-wide off-target assays that use cell lines are basically using a single reference. Um, but what if, uh, what if the cell population you're studying or you're trying to modify has variation? Um, and so this is from a PNAS paper from Stu Orkin's lab, uh, which uses uh, 1,000 genome project data, which um, is an atlas of human, natural, benign human variation, essentially. Um, I guess not necessarily benign, but supposed to be benign. Um, and, it, and here's an example of a guide RNA targeting the ALB gene um, and an off-target site that's predicted in a reference sequence. It's going to be hard for you guys to see, but has two mutations. Um, but if you look at the 1,000 genomes data, you'll see that um, there is a, uh, that there is a common haplotype that's found in 17 percent of the population, where instead of two mutations, and this off-target site has only one, which turns in from a computationally predicted poor off-target site to a, uh, to a rather strong off-target site, uh, suggesting that you have to be very careful about natural variation when you're assessing the effects of, of your genome editing agent. Um, and finally, uh, I want to mention that um, what is what we say, when I say undetectable, there's a reason I'm using that language. Um, and so when you're thinking about potential applications like gene drives or therapeutic gene editing, we're talking about billions of cells that are potentially being modified. And it turns out that the experiments we're doing to say that there is or is not an off-target actually has a floor of detection. Uh, so in cell culture, if you take control cells and just sequence them and uh, try to figure out, uh, you know, are there indels at the target site that look like they could be modified, they could be made by Cas9, uh, just due to sequencing error, PCR error, whatever the error is, uh, around, uh, roughly one in 10,000 uh, cells appear to have off-target effects. So this is kind of our background rate. So we can't actually say below one in 10,000, maybe one in 100,000 that, um, that there are no off-target effects. Um, uh, which is kind of why uh, for our uh, high fidelity paper, we parsed the title very carefully to, to say that there were no detectable off-target effects. Um, uh, so, you know, there are CRISPR variants that leave minimal off-target mutations, but what's detectable is a moving target that uh, we still need to work on. Um, uh, so in summary, you know, Cas9 is specific, wild type Cas9 is specific enough for most research applications. There are high fidelity variants, um, but um, you know what we call high fidelity will change with time. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. We have time for one question. This is our break time, so if any members need to stretch their legs, feel free. Hi, Rick Wychuk, NIEHS. A uh, question about the off-target effects. So if you're taking, say, a cell line and you want to hit a gene, you want to turn it off, you want to homozygose it. So what about the off-target sites? Are they typically homozygosed as well? Or yeah. are they heterozygous, which may not be quite as much of a problem phenotypically within the cell? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I, I haven't actually seen uh, very compelling data uh, on that question yet. Uh, generally, the off-targets are at much lower frequencies than uh, the on-targets. So I think on a population scale, they're much more, you know, they're almost certainly heterozygous. But um, I have not seen a good study that you know, on a single cell level, whether some might be homozy homozygous, but, but you, it's certainly a good point. They're, they're almost certainly going to, you know, more likely heterozygous. Thank you. Thank you.